Okay, I know y'all just came from lunch. But this is critical. We're going to make it fun, but it's important, so I need you with me. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. That's more like it. Thank you very much. I am Tiffany Eubank Saunders with Bank of America, and I could not thank you, Bank of America, in the room. Could not be more pleased than to be here on this day with you ladies looking fabulous, wonderfully engaged, and ready to learn and inspire one another. And so the next hour, we're going to have a pretty real conversation about a topic that we don't talk about a lot, which is black women in health and wealth and why the two go hand in hand and are critically important for us, as many of us are, the heads of household, the leaders in our community, to ensure that we get our houses in order as it relates to not only our health, but also our financial wealth for circumstances and situations that arise that are unexpected. So let me start with a couple of questions. Who knows what wealth is, the definition of wealth? Do I have a, my, right here. All of your assets. <clears throat> so all of your assets, that's a good guess. <laughs> Who else? Definition of wealth. One more person. Oh, right here. Assets minus liability. So wealth is what you own minus what you owe. Couple of questions for you. The median wealth of white U.S. families is $112,200. What do you think the median wealth of African American and black families is? 17,000, what else? <laughs> Negative, okay, well, <laughs> okay, <God. laughs> not quite in that bad state of wealth, but <laughs> 3,000, 40,000, okay, 7,100. So in this country today, the median wealth of black families, not black individuals, but families, $7,100. The median wealth of white women in the US today is $45,400. What do we think the median health of us and our other sisters in this country is? It is $100. So it, I am dead serious. So it is less than the cost of the shoes you have on your feet or the purses that you are carrying. Last question, and then I'm going to tee up a video for you. <clears throat> if you were to deduct the family car, and other depreciation, depreciating assets from net worth, the median net worth for white families in this country is $100,000. What do you think it is for black families? 2,500, 5,000, 3,000, it's 1,700 dollars. So remember, all in 7,100, when you deduct those depreciating assets, $1,700. So think about that as you view this video, and then I will return with my phenomenal guest, and we're going to have a conversation about why those statistics and those facts have to change. Reporting on how to manage, grow, and protect your money is what I do. 
The bottom line is you probably need to be saving more than you're saving right now. Planning for the unexpected is critical. That I know, because it happened to me. The day started like many others, making sure my son and daughter got off to school and coordinating schedules with my husband. Then I went to exercise before heading to the studio. I lifted some weights, started stretching. Suddenly, I felt incredible pain, the worst headache of my life. The rest of the day became a blur of doctors, hospitals, emergency rooms. Scans and images revealed bleeding in my brain. A bulge in the wall of a main artery there had burst. It was a ruptured brain aneurysm. The doctors have told me that she could lose her life or the things that make life worth living. And of those two, I don't know really which is worse. Surgery was just the beginning. I spent two weeks in intensive care, followed by long days of rehabilitation and ready for my recovery. Relearning how to keep my balance and walk upstairs. From caregiver to being cared for, my recovery was more demanding than we ever expected. So suddenly you're immersed in this medical frenzy of making choices that could define your life and your family and your future. And getting back up to speed on running my family's finances took time. Thankfully, I had planned ahead, something financial advisor Stacy Francis says many fail to do. The number one reason for bankruptcy is actually medically related. So if you're not preparing, you could be putting yourself in a disastrous situation of having to use credit card debt, even going into your retirement plan. Ample emergency savings and disability insurance helped pay the bills while I was out of work and is why preparing for the unexpected is something all of us need to do. Make sure that you have at least three to six months of your living expenses. The next thing, look at your disability insurance. Does that pay you enough that your financial situation would still be comfortable and secure? And finally, make sure that your estate planning is updated. The steps I took before my brain injury allowed me to spend time with loved ones instead of worrying about money. My family and friends helped me get stronger, encouraged me to walk farther, and cheered me on as I reached another milestone in my recovery, finishing my first ever 5K race. This was the first race she'd ever done. And the fact that she prepared for it through illness, well, that was sort of an, an amazing moment. All right, so please welcome to the stage the Sharon Epperson. Everybody, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And as you all have seen, Sharon has continued to be a role model and inspiration for black women in this country, not only through her highly successful career as a senior financial reporter for CNBC, but also in the manner in which she has dealt with what in many instances could have been a life-ending illness. And so I am pleased to have Sharon here with me today to really just have a real talk conversation about where are you today in terms of your wealth situation, in terms of the insurances that you need to have to ensure that if something unforeseen happens to you all as it has happened to Sharon at a relatively young age and me at a relatively young age, how would you handle that situation? Because as the, the young lady on the screen mentioned, that was me, the young lady. <laughs> that was Sharon, that's right. <laughs> Mention that when financial issues that seem to be insurmountable in this country occur to families and individuals, it usually has to do with some type of medical illness. So we're going to kick off and get started here. Um, I will share, you saw Sharon's story, I will share that what we share in sisterhood 
is that in our 40s, both of us were diagnosed with illnesses that could have killed us. In January of 2016, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. In March of 2016, I had a double mastectomy, and what was originally supposed to be a pretty straightforward six-month, six-chemotherapy uh, session treatment protocol ended up being 18 months and 28 chemotherapy cycles because I was determined when they removed my tumor and did the pathology review, what they found is that I actually had two types of the more aggressive forms of breast cancer that typically occur more frequently in black and Latino women who are of the age of most of you in here. So again, very different illnesses, but very similar circumstances where at the height of our careers, where we've done a lot of great work, had more great work to do, were pretty much, you know, knocked on our asses by illnesses that we didn't expect. So Sharon, when you think about the fact that you have given or spent your entire career giving people financial advice, what happened when you started, when, when you were diagnosed and the information was shared with you, what came to mind for you in terms of your financial situation and how you were going to deal with it? Well, let me start by um, saying that I'm just so happy to be here. Um, I'm so blessed to be here. Yes. And um, what happened to me was the greatest blessing of my life. Mm -hmm. because um, I'm still here to be able to tell my story and to be able to share with you, I hope, some things that can help you figure out where you are right now in terms of your health and your wealth, because they go together. Yes. And health problems can result in a financial disaster. Mm -hmm. um, as Tiffany shared with you her story, many of us have family members, loved ones, who are suffering or have suffered a major illness, mm -hmm. whether it's cancer or heart disease. And unfortunately, what I didn't realize is how many people in my life, in my family, um, and people now that I'm hearing about, had suffered from a brain hemorrhage or a brain aneurysm. So you may know the statistics that African American women are more likely than white women to have breast cancer, mm -hmm. that African American women are more likely than white women, white people, to have heart disease. African American women are the highest risk of, women, of people that will have a ruptured brain aneurysm. And what that is is just a blood vessel in your brain, and it's a malformation of it, and it explodes. Literally, it explodes. And most of the time, it's immediately fatal. So when I hear stories now of people who had a stroke or collapsed or something and, that, and they don't give the exact detail that it was a brain aneurysm, if I hear that they held their head, if I hear that they said they had the worst pain in their head they ever experienced, I know that they had what I had. Mm -hmm. And as I pray for them, as I mourn them, as I am really devastated by that loss, that inspires me even further to tell you all more about paying attention to your bodies. Mm -hmm. So I know Tiffany, and she, will, she may go into this as well, regular checkups, yes. regular, regular exams, and that's where something is found. In my case, I had regular exams. I am absolutely faithful about my mammograms. I have ultrasounds. I have breast cancer in my family, survivors in my family, so I'm really really religious about that. And when I went for my last exam, my physician told me, you are so on time. This is almost to the day of when you were here last year. <laughs> and I thought, but you don't realize that four months ago, I almost died from something totally unrelated right. that I'd never had checked out, that I never realized that I had. The risk factors that are similar to those for heart disease um, and for some cancers, for brain aneurysms, are smoking, high blood pressure, and I don't have those. 
The ones that are harder to detect, which I know Tiffany and I both shared, shared and share probably, but we're trying to, to deal with that, is stress. Yes. Is stress. So what I learned, um, and, and my journey was not immediate. It was not someone told, this happened to me on September 21st, 2016. And I will tell you that I did not really read about what a brain aneurysm was until probably October or November of 2016. Mm -hmm. One, I was not able, and two, I was not ready. But when I did start to do the research, and I, and I got the research from an organization called the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, I was really interested in knowing if there was some kind of connection between African Americans, women, brain aneurysms, does it happen more? And my neurosurgeons, who were excellent, were all about healing me and saving my life. So I applaud them on that. Mm -hmm. They didn't really know. Right. Or they weren't really focused on how it affected the African American community. So when I went searching and doing research, I found out information from the Brain Aneurysm Foundation they gave me the information that I wanted, one on what was happening to me in a very, in a way that wasn't scary, but just let me know what was going on, and also in a way that gave me information about African Americans and women, and why, in some instances, but more just the fact that we are more susceptible to it. But the one part that it highlighted was that family history also mm -hmm. is a part of one of the risk factors for having a brain aneurysm. And just like many families don't talk about money, right. a lot of families don't talk about why aunt so-and-so, granddaddy, or what passed away. So in my family, and we do talk about our family, and we ha you know, I have a very close family. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and that's where my mother was born and has lived her 81 years. Um, we talked about the fact that her father had passed away from a brain hemorrhage and that her sister her oldest sister had passed away from a brain hemorrhage. But we didn't talk about why mm -hmm. or what their lifestyles were like preceding that or exactly how the, it occurred. And it really wasn't until after my brain aneurysm that I also found out that my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side mm -hmm. also died of a brain hemorrhage. So whether or not these brain hemorrhages that, they, that I knew that they had were a result of an aneurysm, I don't know. I don't know. But... Um, my, my family, um, I guess maybe this is why I'm a business reporter, my, my family in Pittsburgh for um, six decades owned a dry cleaners, Trower's Cleaners. And my grandfather, J. Edward Trower, who founded it, um, he was driving home one day, and it was a snowy night in January, just four months before I was born, and he pulled over because he had the worst headache of his life. Mm -hmm. My mother just told me that a few weeks ago. Mm. I always thought that he'd passed away shortly after my grandmother had passed away because it was a broken heart. They mm -hmm. loved each other so much. Black love, black love. <laughs> and, you know, There's it was that we, ro we, roman we romanticized <laughs> it. But the whole right. practical <laughs> notion of why it happened or how it happened, I never knew that story. And I, as she was telling me, I was devastated. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I had no idea. But yet, I didn't really know much about this before, so maybe I wouldn't, that wouldn't have made me go to the doctor to get an MRA or an MRI and get my head scanned. I, I mean, maybe not. But knowing those stories, it's important. It's so important. Yes. It's so important. So... Um, very long-winded way to answer Tiffany's first question, but I just wanted to kind of explain that it's, that it's all related. So that whole idea of learning about my family's mm -hmm. health, that is just as important, very much so, yes. as learning about and understanding about my family's relationship with money and how they've dealt yes. with money over the years. Absolutely, and you know, it's interesting as you talk, I think about the fact that now we all want to, you know, put our spit in a jar and send it off to get DNA testing and find out what, what continent or where we're from and get all these results about, you know, our lineage. But the reality is many of us, and you don't have to answer out loud, but just think about what Sharon just said. How many of us in this room have sat down with our families? 
sat down with our extended families and had a real conversation about what is the legacy of our illness? What have the people who have come before us in our family passed away from or may have suffered and survived? But what is that medical history and legacy that is part of who you are today so that when you're sitting with your doctors, when you're sitting with your attorneys, if you've got you know, trust documents, or when you're sitting with your accountant as you're thinking about how much money you're going to put away this year for wealth, and I'm suggesting that strongly, versus what you've done in the past, you really have an understanding of what is the legacy that comes with you that you really need to be aware of so that for those types of illnesses that you have a family history of, and to Sharon's point, it may have no, you know, we get diagnosed with things all the time that we don't have a family history of, but that's one nugget of information that could end up saving your life. But you gotta know about it in order to act on it. So moving on from there, when you think about, Sharon, what you would have liked to have known in terms of you know, this highly complicated, highly complex, and very expensive process to deal with a major illness. What are some of the gems of wisdom or pieces of advice that you would share in terms of how these ladies can prepare themselves, hopefully for something that never happens to you, mm -hmm. but will undoubtedly happen to someone in your family or in your life. What are some of the tips that you'd share? Um, I think well, what I always share, and I think many people say, I know I need to do this, I know I need to save more, is just to save. Mm -hmm. Is you know, we're, we're, if we work for a corporation, we are able to have automatic savings through our 401k, so we're saving for retirement. I do a lot of stories on retirement. This is not about that. That That's should right. be done, definitely. But we need to have emergency savings mm -hmm. because emergencies do happen. Back home, where I live now in New York, the, on my Facebook feed is everybody asking about a generator. How much does a generator cost? Because we're having <laughs> snow, power's out. What are we? No one expected to spend, they're like, no, pay for the best that you can get. You want the best that you can get. But what if you haven't budgeted for that for this right. month? You know, you need to have that. You don't know. It can be a household thing. It could be a major medical event. Mm -hmm. But you need to have that emergency savings. So I would say that is something that's very important. And what I did, what I did to make myself do that and what I do to make myself do that is that I live paycheck to paycheck in a different way. Mm -hmm. So the first paycheck that goes out or bill that gets paid when I get paid from my company is to myself. So it's it, to the, the savings, long-term savings I have in addition to my 401k money. I have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, which means college savings is very important. So I have a college savings fund, and so I have long-term money there for them. But I also have that short-term savings for those things that I'm not expecting, mm -hmm. so that I don't have to then dip into my day-to-day -day spending money. I think that's very important. And putting that on autopilot was critical mm -hmm. because my husband is not as interested in managing the day-to-day -day finances as I am, or perhaps I just took it over and now I'm doing it, so right. he's not probably able to get in on it. That's probably right. You <laughs> that's know. probably what We happened. just met yesterday. She already knows that. But that is probably <laughs> how it happened. Um, but putting that on autopilot enabled him to be in the hospital with me every day mm -hmm. and not have to worry about bills being paid because from our accounts, that's right. they were automatically going right. to happen. So that's, that's a key, very, very key part. Um, the other part that enabled me to have peace of mind and know that the bills would be able to be paid because there would be income coming in was having disability insurance. Mm -hmm. So through my company, through many companies, you are offered short-term disability insurance and also long-term disability mm -hmm. insurance. In some companies, you can pay a little bit more, pay your premiums, um, and you may get more. You may have a choice between, say, 40% of your income being covered with disability insurance or, or 
to get the most, you may have to pay the premium. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, and for those people at ADP, as your person who, not, well, NBC Universal is a, is a customer of yours, but I am an employee of that company. I want to say I love you. <laughs> I love you, I love you, because everything, <laughs> because everything on my pay stub, I do pay attention to. So please do that, ladies, if you're not reading your pay stubs to know what taxes are being taken out or make sure everything's being done properly. And there was something on my pay stub one day that said LTD, I guess, or something that it was long -term, about long-term disability insurance. And I wanted to know, why is this small amount of money, but it's being taken out every right. month? And I didn't, well, thank goodness I was paying my own premiums. Mm -hmm. Because then that becomes income that you receive that is a non-taxable event, mm -hmm. which means you don't pay taxes on the money. So you're getting income that is far less than your salary, but you're not paying taxes on that money. And depending on where you live, that's a really, it's really, huge. really, really important thing to know. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. I did not know that beforehand. And that was very, that was a wake-up call saying, I'm really glad I have this. Um, and a wake-up call to know that, me, for me not to panic as much about right. whether or not I have the money. The other thing that I did um, earlier in my career, I was doing a lot of freelance writing. And we were talking about burning the candle from both ends. So that goes to the stress and all that. I don't do that as much. But because I had that self-employment income, I wanted to make sure that was covered as well. So I took out a disability policy on my own, a private disability insurance policy. It's not cheap. And I'm paying it all the time. And I'm not disabled. I'm like, why am I paying all this every month? Is he <laughs> trying to take my money? Is the financial advisor telling me the right, right thing? Thank goodness. Because for that. Again, I'm only getting 60% of my salary. So this is able to make up a little bit more so that, again, I don't have to worry about those bills being paid. And the last part I'll tell you, and this is actually so very important, how many of you have a will? Mm -hmm. So not everybody. Right. How many of you have children? More than have a will. And you know, keep, keep your hands up if you have children and you have a will. So please, please, first thing, when you, when you leave here, mm -hmm. one thing I would love for you to do, I haven't done it yet either, so I can't tell you exactly where to go to find one, <laughs> but a postcard. I want you to get a postcard. Oh, the gift and shop. And as you're thinking, at the gift shop, but I haven't seen it yet to tell you to go this way or that way. But find the, find the postcard at the gift shop. When you leave here today, really, as soon as you do, because I don't want you to forget, send yourself a postcard yep. and say, I need to have a will. Mm -hmm. Or whatever else I hope is a gem that you get from this discussion that you haven't done yet that you want to do and that you need to do. Um, my situation was an emergency. Mm -hmm. So when I had my aneurysm, I was not able to confer with which doctor right. I wanted. I have some excellent physicians in my sister circle. And my husband did reach out to them. And they were not at the hospital that I ended up having my surgery at, because I didn't have time to get to the, right. the hospital that they were at. Um, and so the decision about, should I have surgery? What hospital should I go to? Should we trust these doctors? I was not conscious. So right. I didn't make any of those decisions. So my husband made those decisions. My husband is my healthcare proxy. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who have not determined who that person is, that is so important. You need to have a healthcare proxy. You need to have someone who can make those healthcare decisions for you if you cannot. Mm -hmm. When I was in my early 30s or so, one of my dearest friends, childhood friends, she was not married yet, and she was setting up her estate plan. And she said, I just want to tell you that my friend from work is my health care proxy. I said, you're who? You're the godmother of my children. <laughs> right. And you're, who is she? You met her five years ago. <laughs> and how is she going to be your health care proxy? And she said, you will not pull the plug. You'll be crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so, I'm so surprised that I haven't yet here. But you'll be crying. You'll be, you know. But that was and, real. And it was real. And it was such great advice, such great advice that she knew who she needed. The other person that is so important for you to have is your financial power of attorney. Mm -hmm. And that may not be the same person. 
So for my mother, who knows her daughters very well, I have a sister, there's two of us, she knows one of us is emotional, does not like blood, does not like <laughs> hospitals. That would be the one who was in a hospital for a month, me. <laughs> Um, and one of us is very, and my sister is very organized. She has a whole Google Doc. She can tell you every medication I had, <laughs> every intern that came to see me, every medical student, every, she has everybody. She has it all written down. But I, I do like to manage the money. I do like to follow that. So my mother knows that I'm the right person to be her financial power of attorney. My sister is her healthcare proxy. Um, one thing I will say in a, in a situation where these people come into play is then you can see, actually, it's kind of like a test run. Like, how, how, are the, how, would they, if, how would they really work? Right. And sometimes you may decide, I might want to change that person. Mm -hmm. That might not be the right person. <laughs> right, right. And family situations change. So keep that in mind as well mm -hmm. um, in terms of who you want to have as your financial power of attorney or your health care proxy. And then I will say, you know, I never want this to happen. My husband is a fantastic father. If this had happened with the two of us, I was driving or something, and then what if that happened, and then I crashed? What if we both weren't here? Who would take right. care of my 15-year-old and my 12-year-old? Mm -hmm. Who was going to be the guardian of my child, my children? That is so important. Yes. So mothers, please think about that. Think about that and make sure that it's not the state, but the person that you want is written in this document of who you want. So That's I think right. those three parts of your estate plan are so important. And, and many people, when I talk about having a estate plan, they're like, what you, is that? You, what is that? But why, but why do I have to have one? All I have is debt. Right. So I don't need an estate plan. Yeah. Yes, you need it for these reasons. Yeah. Even if you don't think you have enough assets, that's something that you do when you're wealthy. No, that's something that you do when you care about your loved ones and your legacy. Yep. So it's interesting, let, let's kind of dissect some of what Sharon said, because these are great pieces of advice and discussions that we don't normally have, right? So the first thing she said is, you need to know what you want, so you need to think about what you want, and then you have to have the conversation with the people around you about what you want. You have to really think about and ask people, can you make this decision for me? I don't wish to be in a certain state for an extended period of time with you know, the doctor saying X, can you pull the plug? And once you figure out who needs to be in those positions for you, and I see some of you getting uncomfortable, but this is real. It's real. This is real then you have to make sure you have the right advisors who can document for you. Because depending on the state that you're in, and we all, you know, we all come from different parts of the country, there are laws that will predicate decisions for you unless you very intentionally contract or document your decisions on your own behalf. And so we don't want to get caught in that situation, and we don't want to put the situation on our families. You know, another uh, uh, one thing Sharon and I have spoken about is the fact that when this type of illness occurs, it's not just to the individual. It's to our families. And it is as physically, mentally, and spiritually impactful for them as it is for us. We're going through the illness. They're having to watch us go through the illness. So you have to have those conversations and really understand what people's strengths and opportunity areas are and don't put them in a position where they are not able to act upon what you want to have happen. The other thing she talked about is this whole notion of pulling people in who know how to do what you don't know how to do. We recently did a study of some very senior, very accomplished um, corporate professionals, black executives. And what was very interesting in that study was that about 13% of them, when asked, said, Yes, I have, a, I have a high, I feel like I have a high level of acumen or knowledge 
about my financial health as an individual and for my family. But only 20% of them, when asked, said that they had some time in the past or currently were using a financial advisor. And what I said, you know, to me, that's just like sharing our eye. Now, in my situation, because I was diagnosed, I did get to make a lot of decisions. And what I will tell you is, <coughs> you know, when I found out, I did like many of us would do, many of you would do, I created a plan and I worked the plan, right? I said, okay, this is a project. I get paid to do this all the time, I can do this. And my husband and I flew around the country and met with the top cancer centers in the country because like Sharon and like many of you, I have a history of cancer in my family, both breast cancer and pancreatic cancer, which most people don't live from. And so I said, this is a one and done for me. I need to do this right, and so I have to make sure I have the best treatment possible that I can get. And so I was able to make a lot of those decisions, but I was also able to make those decisions because I had sought out the advisors who could help me get to a point where I was very fortunate. I didn't have to worry about the cost of it. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about the fact that when we surveyed a group of black corporate executives, not people just starting out of school, but people who had been in their careers and made a lot of money, 13% of them said, or said a different way, 87% of them said, I don't really know anything about finances or how to create wealth. But 80% of them also said, but I've never gone to get help around it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's like me being diagnosed with breast cancer and deciding, I can figure this out on my own which I knew I couldn't do. So I, think there's, I think there's also, um, for, many, for many in our community, you know, it took so long to get where we are, mm -hmm. right? It took so long to get where we are. Many in the family have not achieved, gotten, achieved the same. Exactly. And we don't want anyone to take it away. Right. And so we're very cautious and, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say not trusting, but we're... we're it takes us a minute to trust somebody with all that we've mm -hmm. worked so hard mm -hmm. to earn and to mm -hmm. build. But again, as you say, just like with your health, you're not going to try to treat yourself. That's right. When you have a medical emergency, you're not going to, or a medical event, or just to prolong your life and stay healthy. You're still going to, I hope, consult with a doctor, mm -hmm. work with a, f a fitness trainer, you know, maybe you have a nutritionist, who knows? But you need to have that financial advisor. And so for things that, and I cover this all the time, but when it comes to my own finances and I get something from my human resources department that says, do you want to have 40% disability insurance or 60% disability insurance? You don't have to pay anything. We're just going to give you the 40%. But if you want the 60% long-term disability insurance, then you need to pay something. Why? I'm OK. I'm fine. But I put a call in to my financial advisor who was like, you better get everything you can get. You never know. Best and, advice. And, best and advice. Best advice. And let me, just, let me just make this even more real for you in terms of the cost of my treatment. And now remember I said I was diagnosed through a biopsy with one form of cancer and through my surgery ended up being diagnosed with two. Six chemotherapy sessions or cycles to 28. Six months of treatment to 18. I chose because of the very complex nature of my situation to do my treatment away from my home in Baltimore, Maryland at Johns Hopkins. So I had to establish a home in addition to paying for the one that I had. So I recently sat down with my accountant, and we were just kind of pulling together some numbers, trying to get ready for taxes, um, which y'all need to get ready for. <laughs> Don't waste money by paying penalties, because we haven't made the April right. 15th deadline. Let's get that in order. And if you owe, you owe. So wait until October. You're still going to owe. Right, so exactly. you got to pay it now. So. And with interest, <laughs> might as well by the way, with interest on it. <laughs> so we were pulling the numbers together, and I was 
a little shocked. Now, because I'm in financial services and because I deal with high net worth individuals, I had less of a shock, but I was still shocked at the fact that my treatment that was supposed to be six months and six chemotherapy cycles, one surgery, ended up being four surgeries, 18 months, 28 cycles of chemo, and numerous trips to the hospital, all told cost just shy. And I was telling Sharon, when I say shy, I, mean, I don't mean tens of thousands, I mean like hundreds of dollars, just shy of a million dollars. One illness, one time, one set of treatment. Yep. And because I had put, in a little, put a little bit extra into disability insurance, because I had participated in my company's 401k, so if I needed to pull it out, I had it to pull out. That's another issue, right? I won't get on my soapbox about who's People giving know. away free money. Right. Because I had taken the time to pull in place, and I'm in banking. I've been in banking for 25 years, and I still use an advisor because I don't have time to think about it myself. But because I had done all those things, I ended up coming out of pocket $5,000. And my husband, my family, my friends, didn't worry about anything related. Now you think about the fact, put yourself in our position. One day you're fine, the next day you're not, and you either have to be rushed to the hospital right. and put into a coma to go into surgery to operate on your brain, or you're told the illness that kills disproportionately more black women than their white counterparts in breast cancer, is an illness you have, what a gift, what a blessing it is to not have to worry about, how am I gonna pay for this? Right, right. What a gift, what a blessing it is to be able to say to your family and friends, I don't need for you to raise money for me. Right. I just need you to love me. Mm -hmm. I just need you to be there for me instead of having to figure out can I afford this chemotherapy session? Right. They said I needed six, but I really need 28. And they're not cheap. No. So even I just it wanted to share that. To you, but even if it hasn't happened to you directly, there's likely someone in your family, That's right. a parent, a sibling, a friend, that is going through something similar. And I um, had a colleague contact me over the weekend, a um, couple weeks ago, and she doesn't reach out that often, and I figured, you know, maybe this is something, you know, that I need to probably respond to right away. And when I, when I responded by email, her email said, you know, I'm out on a family emergency. Then I really got worried. So I called her cell phone, and she said, you know, I, I, don't, I, I hope you're okay with me asking you this. It's a personal situation, but um, my mother just passed away, mm -hmm. as in like that day or within the 24-hour mm. period. And she said, this was her first question. This is, this is what she was thinking. She said, if my mother hasn't paid all her taxes or has some debt, do, we, do my siblings and I have to pay for that? Mm. Now, her mother was wonderful. And she immediately wrote me back and said, and from all I saw on social media, I knew, she's a wonderful woman and gave so much love and support to my colleague and her family. But the first question that she had in her mind is, what is the financial responsibility mm -hmm. that I'm going to have mm -hmm. now? You want to leave your loved ones in a position of never having to wonder about that. You want to leave them thinking only about the time that they spent with you when you were on vacation together or when they came for Thanksgiving. or what. That's what you want to remember. And um, I learned that lesson from my parents. My father passed away suddenly. Um, seven years ago, and he was in the middle of a meeting and um, went into cardiac arrest. And um, toughest phone call that I've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. And I, my immediately, I'm the oldest, my immediate reaction was I gotta get to my mother and make sure she's okay. Mm -hmm. Flew to Pittsburgh. That week is somewhat of a blur. You know, if you've been there, you understand. The, you know, just getting the funeral arrangements together. Right. 
But the Monday after the funeral, we were meeting with their financial advisors. Mm -hmm. We were changing the, the documents or talking about the fact we were going to have to change the documents and making sure their estate plan reflected my sister and I and our new roles. We were making sure that my mother would be taken care of financially and all that, but we didn't really have to do anything. It was more a discussion of, for my sister and I to know what had already been set up. Right, right. Because I never had to pull out my credit card or a checkbook for the casket or for the, their funeral arrangements were paid for. The mausoleum and the plot of where they are or where my mother will eventually be, where my father is, that was paid for. Mm -hmm. So the emotional devastation that I felt, that my sister and I felt, my mother as well, that was, it was still a very hard time, but we didn't have on top of that, how are we going to pay for it? Right. How are we going right. to feed everybody because they're all going to want to eat something? How are we going to do? <laughs> we didn't worry about any of those things. Right. We didn't worry about any of those things. And I think that that, I wrote a book um, several years ago called The Big Payoff. And it was, I did it for couples because I felt like there weren't that many books about couples and their finances and how to get on the same page as your husband about, mm -hmm. or your wife about finances. And, um, and I start off by talking about how in the first meeting that we had with our financial advisor that we've been with now for over 15 years, my husband fell asleep because he was talking about annuities. He was like, whoa, <laughs> whatever. I was like, really? This is our financial <laughs> life. And you're like literally about to doze off over here. But it was almost like, and throughout these years he's been this person, it's almost like going to see a therapist because I'm all about mental health too. That's all part mm -hmm. of the health equation. Mm -hmm. And I realized through this third party talking us through as I'm like seething, because I'm trying to like make him stay awake, like pinch yourself or do something, um, that he had the same financial goals that I have. I, it should, we've been married to almost 21 years, so that's a good thing, right? That we have the same financial goals, uh, but we may get them, to them differently. Right. And while I may be constantly looking at the finances and all of that, he still wants them to be where they need to be so that we can have the retirement that we want, that our children can go to the colleges that they want, and that we can leave them feeling financially secure. Mm -hmm. um, the, I end the book talking about your financial legacy and talking about the importance of building your estate plan. And as I was writing it, I must say, that was the best part to me, and it sounds so crazy. Like, how could the best part be talking about what happens, you know, <laughs> if you're not here? And it's the best part because that's the legacy. And as, as Tiffany started off, and you all got those answers right, which is also kind of scary of how little wealth we have in our community and as black mm -hmm. women, we need to change that. And the way we can start to change that is to really focus on building our financial legacy. And that estate planning part is a really, really key component. Because as you're doing that, that forces you to really figure out how much money you spend every month. So then how, how much life insurance do I really need? How much does it really cost me to run my household? How much do I need to have to protect what, the, what I have, whether it's the little I have now or the wealth that I have now? Mm -hmm. So that's all really, really important for, for you all to think about. So we, you, as you can tell, Sharon and I could talk about this all day, but we do know and recognize that there are other sessions that you have to get to and other critical information that you need to gain today. So we want to be respectful of your time and just leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, Sharon put out the challenge. Let's sell out these gift stores these gift shops from their postcards, go get a postcard and just write on it. Or what I do is I email myself. <laughs> I email myself from my personal email address and my work email address to my work email address <laughs> of any notes I need to take. But make a note somehow, remind yourself that after you play over the next couple of days, you get back home, you get back in the office on Monday, Make sure that you've got the right advice. Make sure you've got the right advice. If you don't have advice today around how you're going to go from where you are today in terms of your financial health to where you want to be, then chances are you won't get there alone. Okay, two, two, two websites. Can I tell them? Yes. Based on what please. you just said. 
So if you do have your phone out, can you please, if postcard is too old school, I just like getting mail, because I never get mail anymore. Nobody sends me any mail. So I like the postcard. But I also know that at 2.45 to 3.45, and we're going to be on time, Tony. Tony's looking at me. Okay. You put a reminder on your phone right now that every week at 2.45, you could very well be in a meeting, so you may not be able to do it. You are going to just check in. Check in on your finances, whether it is making sure you made that call to find a financial advisor, whether it's just going over the bill. I don't really want to pay it. No, I should pay it. Let me pay right, it right now. Right. Let me figure out how I'm going to pay it. Whatever it is, your financial check-in is every Wednesday at 2.45. It can be for two minutes. Put it in for an hour, just mm -hmm. in case, you know, so that once you get out of that meeting and you think, now I don't have to do it, mm -hmm. yeah, because it'll still be on your phone. The other thing I would say in that first one, a website that I'd like you to put down, because if you don't have a financial advisor and you want to try to find one in your area, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, NAPFA.org. The other organization is the Financial Planning Association, which is FPANet.org. Go on their websites, put in your area code, what are you most interested in? Retirement planning, college planning, estate planning. Find an advisor in your area that focuses on those things that, you, that are on your points of what you want to accomplish. Yep. And that's one way to get started with the advice. And the other way that you can do it here, <laughs> and even more simply, <laughs> is through Bank of America. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and we come in all shades, all types. We're, <laughs> all over the country, please make sure if you haven't already signed up to have a conversation with us because we have some of the most phenomenal advisors here at this conference right now <laughs> here for you. It's free. It's a conversation. It gets you started. If you can't make time or you can't get in to see us here, go to your local Bank of America banking center because we are in every banking center wherever you live, and if you can't for some reason get to a banking center, go to bankofamerica.com and look up financial advisor or Merrill Lynch or Merrill Edge. We have products and services where you can come in with $1. You can open up a Bank of America Merrill Edge account with $1. And then when you save a little bit more and get to 50,000, you can get advice, dedicated advice for you. And then as you move on up, which by the way, if you actually start the habit and make it a behavior, you'll get there in a much shorter time than you would have anticipated. Then as you graduate along, we have different levels of advisors that have different skills, different expertise to help you with Everything from opening up your first investment account to setting up estate plans to pretty much anything you want to do. And so I definitely encourage you to go to the websites Sharon mentioned. But I also suggest <laughs> and would offer up that the best financial advisors on those websites are probably going to be sitting right at your beck and call here at this conference over the next day and a yeah. half. Thank you, ladies, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for the change that is Black Girl Magic forever that begins today. And please help me in thanking our gracious guest, Sharon Epperson. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, ladies.